So at the Cumming School of Medicine, we have a tagline that says, we're creating the future of health. And of course, that begs the question, what is the future of health? And the answer to that question, actually, is fascinating, because I think, and I'm going to show you in the next few minutes, that the, that the answer to what is the future of health is really very simple. And it's something that is called precision medicine and precision public health. And I think if you think about it a bit, there's probably three broad eras of medicine and that healthcare has gone through. And from about the 1950s to the 1980s, these are all about 30-year periods of time. Medicine was practiced in a way that was called, in fact, many different terms, but one of them was intuitive medicine. We sort of knew that a patient was ill. We sort of knew that a few signs and symptoms would give us a diagnosis. And we sort of knew that certain things that we did would make them better. But we didn't really understand why it made them better. We really didn't understand why the signs and symptoms that they had were what they had. And that sort of went away with what was called evidence-based medicine around 1980 or so. And evidence-based medicine was sort of the glory years of medicine. This is where medicine really made a name for itself. This is when science came to medicine. And the king of evidence-based medicine was, in fact, something called the randomized controlled clinical trial. And you'll see this all over the place, that we didn't trust something to work until we could prove that it could work. In the last year or two, evidence-based medicine, I think, is a bit on, its, on the wane. And what is replacing it is something called precision medicine. And the reason for it actually comes out of the gold standard of evidence-based medicine, the randomized controlled clinical trial. You can imagine that we have a disease, we have a therapy, we take 1,000 people with the disease, we give them the therapy, we randomize them, and we find that 700 get better. It's a wonderful study. That now becomes the gold standard for treating that disease. We say it treated that population, but there were 300 people that didn't get better or got worse. And so, in fact, we were not precisely treating those individuals. This isn't new. It was not just us doing this. This is the, um, the State of the Union address by Barack Obama last January, where he announced that the US was going to have a major initiative on precision medicine. And what is precision medicine? Well, precision medicine is almost everything that evidence-based medicine is not. It is not about treating populations. It is not about treating the average. It is about precisely understanding the diagnosis of an individual, precisely understanding why they have that disease and what variant of the disease they have, and you're going to hear about that tonight. But most importantly, it's because we can match a precise therapy to that cause of the disease. We now have medications, we now have drugs that treat individual pathways, and I'll show you a little bit of that. So what Barack Obama did was he asked Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, to undertake a precision medicine initiative. And in October of last year, the National Institute of Health took this on, developed their initiative, published it, and it said the time for precision medicine is now for three reasons. One, we've sequenced the human genome. We understand the human genome. Secondly, that we've got improved technologies for biomedical analysis. We can understand why people have certain diseases. And thirdly, we can integrate all that data with, with big data. We can understand it. Most importantly, what precision medicine allows us to do now is because we understand the scientific basis of many different diseases and why amongst pneumonia, not all pneumonias are the same, or why amongst rheumatoid arthritis, not all of the pathways are the same, we can match specific therapies to those diseases. So I'm going to give you three snapshots, three interesting cases. And I'm going to talk, one, about diagnosis and treatment. I'm going to give you a clinical case. We're going to pretend that everybody here is a medical student, and we're going to present a clinical case. I'm going to talk to you about a new way of looking at diseases that we've never thought about before. This is a second case. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about precision public health and how we need to think about public health in a precise way. So I'm going to give you a case right now. And this is a case of a young little guy called Ben, a very happy four-year-old child. Ben is the one in red. Sousa Bensler, of course, is Ben's doctor. Sousa actually sent me this case, and this is from actually last summer, actually. So this is a wonderful, interesting case of precision medicine in Calgary. So I'll tell you Ben's story. So Ben was a very happy young child. 
and he came into the Children's Hospital actually last year for an elective minor surgical procedure, nothing to worry about. But when he came in and he was getting ready for the oper operation, the nurses found that he was extremely hypertensive. He had a very high blood pressure. A child's blood pressure at this level is a major risk for things like a stroke, so it's a big issue. His surgery was canceled. He was immediately brought into the intensive care unit, and he was found to have, obviously, critical hypertension, but his kidneys were also failing. And so he underwent a test called an MR angiogram, a magnetic resonance angiogram. And unfortunately, I don't have a pointer here, but I'm going to show you this. So if you look on the right, I want you just to look at the right side for a moment. And this, in fact, is, is a normal MR angiogram. An MR angiogram is a technique where the X-ray, the certain pulse waves that are put into the MR machine show movement. So anything that's moving turns white. And so what you can see, the big white blob in Ben's chest up here is his heart, where all the blood is moving. You'll see that the blood moves up the aorta, goes up, and then straight down his back. At the bottom of the slide, the aorta splits to the two big arteries that go to his legs. You can see the arteries that go to his brain and down his arms. The other thing I want you to notice is that his kidneys, the two big blobs in the back of his abdomen, are bright because the kidney gets a huge blood supply. Now, Ben's angiogram is on the left, and it's quite different. And if you look at it, and I wish I could point it out, if you look in between his kidneys, you'll see that his aorta is all narrowed, unlike the normal-looking aorta. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that the little arteries that go to his kidney, the one on the left-hand side of the slide, is narrowed. And that's why he's got high blood pressure. Our kidneys tell us whether we need to increase or lower our blood pressure. If the kidney doesn't get enough blood, it releases some hormones into the blood called renin and angiotensin that raise our blood pressure. So Ben is hypertensive because his right kidney is not getting enough blood. And the reason his right kidney is not getting enough blood is he has a disease called Takayasu's disease. It's an inflammation in the lining of the artery. So Ben has lots of inflammation in the lining of his artery. It's tight, it's constricted. His blood pressure has gone up because the kidney has been sending all these signals, and Ben is ready to have a stroke. This actually is a, is a severe illness. So how do you treat him? He's sitting in the ICU, and the current therapy, I have to tell you, is remarkably imprecise. What you want to do is reduce the inflammation that Ben has in his arteries. And what we do today, and what we would normally do, is we would use steroids. Drugs called prednisone or corticosteroids, many of you have probably had these. These suppress inflammation from many, many different types of, inf of inflammation. It doesn't matter what causes it, steroids suppress it. But one of the problems with steroids is they cause hypertension. They cause your blood pressure to go up even more. And in a young kid like this, who's ready to have a stroke, the last thing you want to do is to give him steroids. And this is where precision medicine comes in. If we knew the specific pathway that was driving his inflammation, there was a chance that we could have a specific therapy that would block it. And so, in fact, what Susa Bensler did last year, she took a little bit of Ben's blood, sent it over to the Cummings School of Medicine, actually, to a lab by a fellow by the name of Marvin Fritzler, who identified that in Ben's case, a very specific mediator of inflammation, it's a protein, it's called TNF-alpha, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's a protein. It drives inflammation, and the other part that was important is we actually have drugs that are antibodies against TNF-alpha. They're not drugs that you would normally use for Ben's disease, but in fact, they work perfectly for him. So in fact, he was given infliximab, a drug that we use all the time for treating patients with Crohn's disease. His blood pressure comes down to normal, and in three days, he's not only discharged from the ICU, he's back at home, actually. And after six months, this, in fact, is on the left is his original angiogram. On the right is Ben's angiogram six months later. All of his blood vessels are open. He hasn't lost a leg. He hasn't had a stroke. And this is precision medicine. And I love this example of precision medicine because a lot of people, when you hear this, say, that's not precision medicine. You didn't sequence a single genome. How could that be precision medicine? But it is. There is a precise identification of what was wrong with Ben and a precise matching of therapy to what he had. So I'm going to give you a second 
snapshot. And this is something, actually, that the coming School of Medicine is going to lead in globally. This is something we're really good at. I want you to imagine that we've just suddenly discovered a new organ. Never heard about this organ before. This is sort of like back, you know, back in the 1600s when people didn't know what the heart was. It was a big muscle, and because you only ever looked at hearts that weren't moving, you never realized this is what actually pumped blood. It was many years, we didn't know what the heart did. But this is 2015, and we have recently discovered a new organ. What if I told you it controlled our weight, our risk for cancer, whether we got chronic inflammatory disease like asthma or arthritis, or we didn't? And it controlled our mood, controlled whether you were autistic, whether you were depressed or not, or whether you might even have schizophrenia. Well, in fact, we have discovered that, and it's a thing called your microbiome. I'm going to talk a little bit about the microbiome, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the data, but the microbiome actually, we know, controls a lot of things that we used to think were caused by others. We know that it's related to things that happen in your brain. We know that it causes inflammation in a variety of places. We know that it causes obesity, and I'll show you a little bit of data on that. And in fact, there are some cancers that are driven by the microbiome. So why is it important? Well, it's important because we are not who we used to think we are. We are 90% alien. For every cell that you have in your body, you have 10 bacteria in your gut. You're outnumbered 10 to 1. We, if we do it by numbers, we are mostly bugs. We're not mostly human. And in fact, if you do it by genes, it's even worse. For every gene we have in our body, there are 1,000 bacterial genes. We're outnumbered 1,000 to 1, not just 10 to 1. So we truly are at least 90% alien. I want to talk about one experiment done a few years ago, which is a remarkable experiment, and that is, do our bacteria that live in our gut make us fat? Is that why we get overweight? Because it's sure as heck not our genes. We've had an epidemic, actually, around the world, actually, of obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, heart disease. And in fact, if you go to developing countries like China and you plot the incidence of chronic inflammatory disease and weight gain, it is a linear relationship with the number of McDonald's restaurants that are opened up. It's an interesting correlation. So this is an interesting experiment. I'm going to show you this one picture, one slide, and I want to go through it with you. These two women are twins. They are genetically identical twins. And you might wonder about that, looking at them, but they are twins that are discordant for body weight. They don't agree on body weight. And so the reason that one is slim and one is not is not because of a genetic difference. They are genetically identical. And so Jeff Gordon in St. Louis did this experiment about 10 years ago. And he asked, is the difference in weight not controlled by their genome, but by the microbiome genome that they have in their gut? And he did a simple experiment. He took the microbiome from each of these two twins, and he put them into a germ-free mouse. So this is a mouse that has been raised germ-free. It has no microbiome. It has no bacteria in it. So you take the human bacteria, and you put it in the mouse, and you watch what happens to the mouse. The mouse who got the microbiome from the obese twin becomes obese. The microbiome from the slender twin loses weight. And the fascinating thing is, because it's the mouse and you can check, they didn't eat any differently. They ate the same amount of calories, because we could measure that. How many times have you heard somebody say, I keep gaining weight, and I don't eat anymore? It's actually what, exactly what these mice did. And the difference is, because again, you could measure it, is that the bugs in the mouse that made the mouse obese were able to metabolize food in a different way and made more calories available to the host. So for the same amount that you took in, you could actually get more calories. And in fact, because you could do this in a mouse rather than a human, you could then take the obese mouse and swap the microbiome between the two mice, and the, and the body, share, body habitus follows the microbiome. So, for some of us, it does make you fat. And the final case, or the final example I want to show you and just share with you, I'm going to ask a provocative question that I can only ask because my mother is not here. <laughs> so, was your mother right? And some of you will recall this. 
I don't, how many here as, as children were fed cod liver oil? Oh, it's one, can you still taste it? Yeah, it's awful stuff, utterly awful. So mothers in the 60s, 70s, 80s fed their kids cod liver oil, and I'm told that mothers love their kids, and maybe this is an example of it. So this is where her idea came from. And this is a picture of happy, smiling Inuit children from, from Greenland, actually. And in the 1960s and 1970s, a group of Danish epidemiologists came to Canada and Greenland to study the Inuit children. And they made two observations. The first was, they're happy, smiling, healthy kids. Just look. And the second thing is they looked around the background here and said, there's not a tree in sight, there's not a grain, there's not a vegetable growing. All these people eat is meat and it's fatty. And everything that we knew at that time said that these people should be dying like flies of heart disease. And yet they weren't. So the epidemiologist said, well, that's really interesting. How come that's true? And they identified what people ate instead of vegetables and greens and all those good things and found that it was fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids. And they said, aha, omega-3 fatty acids must be good for you. It must protect against all those things. And that's why your mother gave you cod liver oil pills. The only problem, the only problem with that entire hypothesis is that every study done since shows that omega-3 fatty acids are useless. They don't protect you from heart disease. They don't protect you from cancer. I spent a year feeding omega-3 fatty acids to mice that hated it, just like I did, and I couldn't change their immune system no matter how I measured it. They don't work. So how come? This, in fact, was what was shown actually in September of last year. This is a study that was published in Science. And it essentially looked at where the Inuit came from, and they were descended from a group of people from northern China, southern Siberia. And you can look at them genetically. And as they migrated and moved into this landscape, they adapted to this landscape. And they changed about 20 genes that were different. Three of them are fatty acid genes that metabolize these fatty acids. 100%, not 90%, not 95%, but 100% of the Inuit have these genes. In, in us, in the rest of the North American population, 2% of us have these genes. So your mom was right. If you're an Inuit child, these genes save your life. For the rest of us, they just taste awful, <laughs> and they do nothing. So I'm going to finish and say the future of your health, of all of our health, is going to be precision medicine and precision public health. It is the future. It is coming at us incredibly quickly. You're going to find that, in fact, probably within the next five years, you're going to see lots of examples of this, and you're going to hear some examples from our next two speakers who do some amazing stuff in this area. But the, one of the things I want you to imagine is what we could do if we did this together. So we have a vision of bringing precision medicine to Calgary and to southern Alberta. And in fact, I want us to build a building out the back, which will be a precision medicine building for Calgary, where when you come in, we'll swab your cheek, we'll have your genome sequence by the time we see you in the afternoon. We will look at your microbiome. I won't tell you how we'll get a sample, but we'll get a sample. <laughs> that part's easy. And after collating all of your clinical data, all of your records, all of the stuff from the Fitbits and the various things that are going to be prominent over the next several years, we'll sit down and have an informed chat about how we deal with whatever problem it is that you have or whatever disease we want to prevent. Thank you.